of all the societies that the ministry of the word of the Lord has been sent, I am convinced that our society today is possibly the most challenging. The reason is that narcissism permeates our culture in America today. By narcissism, I mean self-absorbed, self-focused, self-obsessed. If it's not doing something for me, I ain't interested in it, is the attitude of narcissism. And I wish I could say it stopped at the doors of the church, but it don't. It's here this morning. And many of us struggle in our faith because we see our theology through the lens of a prevailing paradigm of selfishness. When we look into the scriptures and we listen to messages and we perceive our God, the the main question on our mind is where do I fit into it and what's in it for me? But theology is not the study of you. Theology is the study of God. And yes, to be sure, we do need to be encouraged. We do need personal ministry. We do need hands laid on us. We do need to be prayed for. We do need to be prophesied to. But if we only ever hear messages about ourselves, then our faith is anchored in us. And what this creates is this creates great fluctuation, okay? Uh, So when things are going good, faith is great. This is working. I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And then when life hands us something difficult, when it gets hard, when tears start to stain your pillow every night, and feel like God has abandoned you and God has forgotten you, and how could a good God let something this bad happen to me? I mean, I'm me after all. Circumstances change. So your faith can't be rooted in something that is transient. Your faith has to be anchored in something that stays the same regardless of the circumstances that you're going through. So while we do need a few messages about us and how we relate, we need a greater focus on our God. Here's a few things, just a few things about our God you need to know. Number one, God is sovereign. I knew that would get a big crazy shout that y'all be running up here and throwing stuff at me and going crazy. God is sovereign. Which means you're not the king and you're not the queen. Okay. You're not the CEO of the universe. You can't control everything. It's God who is sovereign. Sovereign means he absolutely reigns, that he's in total control. Look at Isaiah 45, 7 through 9. Beautiful scripture about the sovereignty of God. This is God speaking in Isaiah 45, 7 through 9. He said, I form the light. And create the darkness. People don't like that. People love the messages where preachers get up and say, darkness is not a real thing. Darkness is just the absence of light. And when the light of God shines on you, no darkness. That ain't the word. I, 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 I form the light and, and I, I create the darkness. Dark days do have a purpose even if you don't like them. I form the light and I create the darkness. I make peace. You ain't going to like this. I make peace. You ain't going to like this scripture. I make peace and put that in your promise box on your fridge. I make peace and create calamity. Because calamity has a purpose even if you can't see it. 
there are some purposes in your life that would never be accomplished without the assistance of good old calamity. In fact, when no preacher can reach your stubborn heart, sometimes God will send the evangelist of calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. He's in control of it all. Next verse, rain down, you heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. This next one's really good. Woe to him who strives with his maker. I want to press this point because there's been a lot of that going on. The Lord let me hear some of your whisperings last week. You're striving with your maker. You're striving over your life. Some of you hate the season you're in. You hate the circumstances you're in. You hate what you've been dealt. You hate, some of you hate the family you're in. Look straight at me, not to the left or the right. Some of you hate the situations that you're in, not realizing you have a maker who ordains you and ordered your steps. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I'm too short. I'm too tall. I don't have this opportunity. I don't have that. You have a maker. Amen. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the pot sheared strive with the pot sheards of the earth. In other words, pot sheards, broken pieces of clay. Okay. He said, shall the clay say to him who forms it? I knew this would not go over good. It's going to get better. <laughs> Shall the clay say to him who forms it? What are you making? The imagery is beautiful. He's saying, let the pot sheared strive. He said, don't try to strive with your maker. He said, all a pot sheared or a broken piece of clay. Imagine a beautiful potter's studio. And he's got all of his works on the shelf. And, and then he's got all of the pieces of clay that haven't come together yet. And they're just lying in pieces and shards on the ground. They will eventually be made over into something new. But right now they're just lying on the ground. He said, you can't strive with me. You can't fight with me. Best you can do is fight with the other jarred, uh, broken pieces of clay that are laying on the ground with you. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Why did you make me like this? Why did you let me go through this? Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, he has no hands. He doesn't know what he's doing. I don't understand this. In fact, give me the next verse. I know I didn't tell you all that, but give me the next verse. Isaiah 45, 10, if you can. Isaiah 45, verse 10. I, it's my fault. Oh, y'all are amazing. Woe to the one who says to a father, <laughs> what have you begotten? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? In other words, he's saying in the same way you did not as an individual decide to be born into this earth, you're here as the result of somebody else's decision. In a greater way, he's saying, you're here in this earth because I made you. God is sovereign. And the sovereign God rules over your life. Next scripture, Job 38, 4 through 13. This is the scripture when all of the difficulty and the calamity fell upon Job. And Job started complaining. And Job said, I've been righteous. I found out what your laws were and what your instructions were. And I lived my life according to your will. I loved you, God, and I hated the things of evil. And how could a good God allow a good Job to go through such a bad circumstance? And finally, God got tired of it and God responded. This is what a sovereign ruler sounds like. He said, Job, um, where were you? When I laid the foundations of the earth, I worship you, almighty God. Where were you 
when I laid the foundations of the earth. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors when I said, this is God talking to the ocean, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. Have you commanded the morning since your day began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Who talks like that? Sovereign. God is sovereign. Psalm 100 and then verse 3. I'm in the NIV on this one. Psalm 100. I'm in the NIV the rest of the way. Psalm 100 verse 3. If you could grab that for me really quickly. I know I keep going back and forth on y'all upstairs. Y'all are great. Know that he, or know that the Lord, he is God. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he whom. You, you need to have a head-on collision with this revelation. It is he who made us. And we are, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. God is sovereign. Next thing I want you to know about God. Number two, God is good. I put God is good second. No, listen to me. Don't, don't churchify it. Listen to me. I put God is good second. A lot of people would put it first. I put it second because it should amaze you that since God is sovereign, he don't have to be good. He could be God and not be good. If he were not good, who'd put him in trouble? And yet as sovereign, absolute, can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, whatever he wants. As sovereign as he is, he chooses to be good. He's good to you. When you're not good to him. He's faithful to you. When you're unfaithful. To, he's loyal to you. When you're not loyal to him. God is good. A couple of scriptures about that. Psalm 25, 8 and 9. Psalm 25, 8 and 9. Look at the scripture. It's beautiful. Psalm 25. Eight and nine. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, and this is for you and I, this is amazing. Because he's good and upright, that's what that therefore means there. Because he's good and upright, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. God is good and he's good to bad people and he's good when we didn't deserve it and he's good even though he doesn't have to be. <laughs> Psalm 31, 19. Psalm 39, one, uh, 31, 19. How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all. That means there are some blessings that everybody's going to have to see you get. Yeah. Yeah. 
Say it again. I just like it. There are some blessings that everybody's going to have to see you get. He bestows in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. Now look at somebody and say, God is good. Now look at them and tell them honestly. Tell them. I want you to say it. Everyone talking right now. Everyone talking. Say, he's been good to me. Now I want you to look at somebody. I know it's uncomfortable, especially if you're socially awkward. I want you to look at somebody and say, no matter what I've said before, God is still good. He's good. So he's sovereign. He's good. Third thing, you got to know. Folks, you've got to know this. He's unchanging. Our God does not change. Staying in the NIV, Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. I want you to see this scripture. I want you to see this scripture. It's beautiful. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. God's gifts. And his call are irrevocable. Say it again. I want you to focus on the word call. God's gifts and his call, they're irrevocable. Meaning God will never call you and then change his mind. But pastor, I've failed. Pastor, I've fallen away. Pastor, I've backslid. Pastor, I'm, I'm running in the opposite direction. I, I know that God had something for me to do. Or I know that God had a plan for me and a space for me and a place for me. But, but I haven't been following that. I feel like I've blown it. I feel like I've messed up my purpose. I feel like I've, I've canceled my destiny. No. The weight of the call is never on the one who receives it. The weight of the call is based on the strength of the one who gives it. John, stand right here. He doesn't know why he's standing here. And you don't either. But you're all looking at me. Why are you looking at me and not putting all the responsibility on him to do something? Because I was the one that called him. So in this room, while I'm holding the weight of your attention and your listening ears, your eyes are focused not on the subject of the call. Your eyes are focused on the one. I know pastor's going to do something. He's not just going to leave him up there. The weight of the call the responsibility of the call is on God, not you. And he says, the gifts and the call. Oh, the gifts, and, meaning God will never give you a gift and then take it back. You hear some people say sometimes, man, they used to have such a gift, but they lost it. No, no, not if it came from God. The gifts God gives, he won't give it and then take it back. And the call God sends out, if he ever called you once, if he ever called you once, if he's ever spoken to you one time, if he ever sent his spirit, if he ever touched your heart with a message, if he ever woke you up in the middle of the night with a dream, if he's ever called you once, then he is yet calling you. Because he does not change. It would violate his sovereignty to call you and then cancel the call because it was a sovereign call in the beginning. 
it would cause the universe to implode upon itself for God to change something that he has spoken. Now, certainly, if God calls you and you don't respond, or if God calls you and you get off track, surely then he'll cancel the call, right? Wrong. God called Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach. Jonah said, no. Tarsus. Opposite direction. God called him over here. He went on a boat as fast as he could over here. You'd think God would say, well, I'll just get somebody better. You don't want nothing to do with what I'm asking you to do? Fine, I'll just cancel that. Cancel your purpose. Wipe you off the face of the earth and start over with somebody else. No! Because when you violate God's call, he doesn't change. He chastens. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so... God didn't write off Jonah and blot his name out of the book. God sent a storm. And God sent a whale. The Bible says the Lord prepared a fish. That means the sovereign creator made a special fish. God knows how to make a fish just for you. He, he said, I'm going to make a special fish. And the, the, the design of this fish was to be able to swallow Jonah and take him to the bottom of the ocean floor without killing him. And it took God three days to chasten Jonah. But God never changed. God said, I'm so committed to you that if I have to chasten you into submission, I'll chasten you. Until you break and you change, but I will not change my call. And Jonah said, it's one of my favorite little scriptures. Jonah said, out of the belly of the fish cried I. <laughs> but he doesn't change the call. If it didn't change for Jonah, ladies and gentlemen, it has not changed for you. Incidentally, God can't even change in his attributes. In other words, there's foolish theology permeating today saying that uh, the miracles and the gifts and the healings and all those things, uh, they stopped. This is cessationalism. They stopped uh, in the days of the apostles. But, but that violates God's sovereignty. In other words, whatever God ever could do, can do. Whatever God was, God still is. If he was a healer, if he even only ever healed one person, if he was it once because of his nature as God, he continues to be it. If he was a provider, he is a provider. If he was a deliverer, he is a deliverer. If he did answer prayers, he does answer prayers. If he did forgive sins, he does forgive sins. He doesn't change. To change in his attributes would be to change in his nature. And God does not change. If if Moses would have known this, it would have saved him 40 years of his life. Back in Acts chapter 7, verses 23 through 29, Moses, who you remember, was he was a Hebrew, born at a time when the Pharaoh had commanded that the Hebrew women throw the male babies into the Nile because they were concerned about overpopulation. Instead of throwing him in the Nile, his mother hid him, put him in a little basket and pitched it with tar and mud and made it float and sent him down the Nile. And Pharaoh's daughter found the basket while she was taking a bath and she adopted him as her own. So he is a Hebrew from the enslaved people. And yet he grows up in the house of a king. But all of his life, Pharaoh's daughter made a mistake. She, she hired Moses' own mama to nurse him, to take care of him, and to raise him. 
And if you let one of us people of faith, if you let us have a chance at our kids, then when we're feeding them, we'll tell them about the goodness of God. And when we're bathing them, we'll tell us about how we wouldn't have made it and the family would have never survived if God wouldn't have covered us and protected us. We'll tell them about the Ten Commandments. We'll tell them about, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and beside him there is no other. We'll tell them stuff about Jesus' name, baptism, and being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues and prophesying and seeking God's favor, seeking God's hand. You, you give a real believer a chance at a kid, we'll put some minimum. And so Moses, mama's put, just pouring, she's giving him more than breast milk. She's given him the milk of her soul. She's given him the milk of her faith. She's giving him the milk of her belief system. She's pouring it in the kid because she knows she's got to send him back to a pagan environment. She's got to send him back to a pagan culture that incidentally is the culture that's oppressing them. So she wants to put something deep in his spirit that the culture can't break. So she delivers while she's holding him in her bosom. She delivers a faith to him. And that faith starts growing. He's growing up in Pharaoh's house. He's learning Pharaoh's dialect. He's dressing like Pharaoh, talking like Pharaoh, getting educated by Pharaoh. But Pharaoh can't snuff out the fire of faith that burns within his spirit. And when he was 40 years old, the fire on the inside was out of control. I may have been raised in this culture. I may have been raised by these people. But my heart belongs to the Hebrews who are oppressed. And I feel like God is calling me to deliver them and bring them out of the clutches of this culture that has intended for their demise. And, and so one day he's walking and he's feeling this fire, this passion, this purpose. I feel like this is why I was born. I feel like this is why the crocodiles didn't eat me up in the Nile. I feel like this is why Pharaoh's daughter happened to be taking a bath at the same time my little, my little basket was floating by. I feel like God preserved me for this. I feel like this is the reason. I feel like this is my destiny. I feel like this is my life. I'm going to rescue the Hebrews. And as he's burning and walking and feeling and crying, just feeling the, the weight of, of the significance of his purpose in his life, he sees an Egyptian beating mercilessly a Hebrew. And the fire in him boils over. No, uh, I'm a deliverer. Uh, uh God has called me to bring y'all out of this. And he goes over and he kills the Egyptian that's beating the Hebrew. And he goes home, and although he did something wrong, he took a life, he, he goes home, and he feels emboldened. He feels impassioned. He goes and he cries all night. It would have been a trophy in his life. I finally know what I'm here for, because there's no feeling like the feeling you get the first time you do something you know you're destined to do. There's no drug like it. Okay. There's no philosophy that can take you into it. The first step you take in God's purpose for your life, there's no feeling like it. And he's excited. And the next day, you know, he's kind of, he's kind of feeling himself. You know? He walks by and he sees now two Hebrews fighting. And he goes up as this newfound great leader and deliverer and he says, hey, Y'all fighting for him. Don't you know your brothers? What's this squabble about? And one of the Hebrews pushed him and said, Who is you? <laughs> Who made you rule over us? Who made you judge? What are you going to do? Kill me? Like you did that Egyptian yesterday? <laughs> Moses heard that. He fled. You got to understand. His soul is crushed. He 
he's been believing all of his life that he's been hearing from God that this is his purpose. And the first time he stepped out into it, he got rejected. There was 40 years of build up to this moment. And that's a long time to wait for a moment. And when his moment finally came, he blew it. He got rejected. He can't stay in Egypt anymore. The word's out. This chatterbox is talking about it. You gonna kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? Moses knows it's only a matter of time till it gets around to the to the Pharaoh's court and guards of what he did. So he doesn't feel like he can stay in Egypt. So he flees. And he goes to Midian. Now, for 40 years, he's in Midian. And I like the, what the scripture said there. It said he settled in Midian. The settling place is the place you go to when you got rejected in the place of your purpose. Oh, we'll say it again. The settling place is the place you land in when you tried the purpose route and you got rejected, got your feelings hurt, didn't try again. You just went somewhere else and, and settled there. So the greatest prophet in the Old Testament is backslidden, hiding in Midian for 40 years, thinking he's missed his moment. And that God's purpose for his life was canceled. 40 years is a long time. You rebuild in 40 years. So in 40 years while he was settled in Midian. He met a little girl. Started dating. Long courtship. They got married. Had two kids. Started a business. Working for his father-in-law. Started a community. And he was successful in Midian. Let me say that because I want you to grasp this. He was successful, full of success in Midian. But success does not necessarily relate to purpose. Say that over here. I said success does not necessarily relate to purpose. You can be successful and wrong. You remember when God told Joshua, if you keep this book of the law in front of your eyes, you meditate on it day and night, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. If there's a thing as good success, there's also a thing as bad success. If your success is not congruent in line with the purpose of God for your life, then it's bad success. What kind do you have? But he's successful in Midian. And, and he loves Midian, but for the wrong reasons. See, he's a fugitive in Egypt. And he's rejected in Egypt by his own. And oftentimes, rejected people will gravitate toward whatever circle will accept them. Because rejected people crave acceptance even if they have to violate purpose to get it. Okay. So here he is in Midian thinking this is his life. He's minding his own business, tending to his flock. When the unchanging God appears to him inside, of a burning bush. Now there's two messages here. Two. Before God ever speaks to his ears. He gives him an illustrated sermon for his eyes. Moses is amazed at what he's seeing. Because there's a bush on fire. Not strange for a bush to be on fire in the hot arid climate of the Middle East. The fire's not strange. What's strange is 
the bush is on fire, but it's not changing. Fire is a change agent. When you want to change the structure of something, you apply fire to the situation, and fire will bring a change. And Moses is amazed because the bush is on fire, and it's been on fire a while, and he's been watching a while. It's just that the fire is not causing it to change because the unchanging God is in the bush. And the first message Moses' eyes are getting is whatever he's in and whatever he's touching is not subject to the changes that fire brings. We're all going to go through some fire in our lives, but when you notice something on your life that's on fire, and yet it's not burning up, when you notice something that's on fire, and yet it is not destroyed, you know that an unchanging God is somewhere down in that thing. And you don't have to say nothing, but there's a few of you that are in here. Your marriage was on fire, and there's no way you should have stayed together. But y'all messed around and pulled an unchanging God into the circumstances of your family. And some of you still can't even explain how you made it and how you stayed. And I'm going to tell you the reason was, though you were on fire, there was an unchanging God in the fire with you. It's why the three Hebrew boys couldn't burn up when they cast them into the fire. Because they looked, they said, I thought we threw three in there, but there's a fourth walking around in the fire. All that had to happen was the unchanging God stepped down into the fire with them. And what would normally cause change and mutation did not affect them. And I'm telling you, if the unchanging God is in your heart, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord and your Savior, there's not a fire that you can go through in this life that has the ability to bring changes or mutations when an unchanging God is living on the inside. And then he's, that was, he's just seeing, I'm seeing something that should be burning but ain't. I, I'm seeing leaves of purpose and destiny that the fires of time should have destroyed, that the fires of disobedience should have destroyed, that, that the fires of my own misconduct should have destroyed. And they are on fire, but they're not burning up. Maybe fire doesn't burn everything up. Maybe time don't tear everything down. And then that bush started talking. God knows how to talk to you. The, the, the bush started talking, and, 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 and it, it's, it's, it's weird. Moses hadn't spoken to God for 40 years. How long has it been since you did? Jehovah wasn't worshipped in Midian, you know. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he was an idol maker. For 40 years, he has been indoctrinated by idolatry, wickedness. And after 40 years of not talking, God shows up. Wonder what he'll say to break the silence of 40. What do you say to somebody you hadn't spoken to in 40 years? He says, I am the God of Abraham. 
In other words, I know it's been a while since we talked, and I, I know you got your little idols in your house, and, and I know you thought your purpose was over, but I don't want to remind you who you are. I want to remind you who I made you to be. I, your sovereign maker, want to remind you of what I purposed and destined you to be. I'm the God of Abraham, your father. In other words, you are the heir of a covenant of promise I made with you in mind before you got here. Jesus, you are the heir of a covenant of promise that God made with you in mind before you got here. You don't care what I am saying. You are the heir of a covenant of promise that God made with you in mind before you ever got here. I am the God of Abraham. He said, and I'm the God of Isaac. This is the first time in the Bible he introduces himself this way. You'll see it again all through scripture. But this is the first time. He said, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And then he shocks Moses and says, and the God of Jacob. The text says, when God said Jacob, Moses started trembling. He started shaking all over. His emotions are upended. His soul is literally dumping out. Because I knew you were the God of Abraham. The man you made your original covenant with. I knew you were the God of Isaac, the faithful one, who was willing to lay down his life, obedient to his father. But I didn't know that she was the God of Jacob. Mom and daddy taught us that Jacob was so crooked, you had to change his name. Mom and daddy taught us that Jacob was so dishonest, you had to come down from heaven and wrestle with him all night. Knock his hip out of joint. Leave him living with a limp. Because you wanted to mature him. And you wanted to pull the prince out of him. And you wanted to pull the best version of himself to the surface. And after the wrestling match, you changed his name. And you, you said, you, you said his name is going to be called Israel. But you didn't say you were the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You chose to identify yourself with the screw up, with the con artist, with the deceiver and the supplanter, with the one that was known as a trickster, with the one whose reputation was in the trash, with the one even his own brother wanted to kill, with the one that his daddy was disappointed in, with the one who was on the run all of his life because he couldn't tell the truth. now Moses is just shaking because the truth is everybody's got a little bit of Israel and Jacob down on the inside of them I hate to tell you I'm gonna give you a free personality assessment we all have multiple this whole section just left me like I don't know for a fact what I'm talking about there's the good side prince or the princess what's your what your highest aspirations are you at your best and then there's that other joker down in there that, that you hate when he comes out this is the one that that, that the next day uh, the prince says what was I thinking and when we come to God and we're in the presence of God and we feel the anointing and we feel the glory of the Lord which Moses felt in that moment when we're standing on holy ground we like to present to God the version of what we should be not knowing that God didn't call who you should be 
He simply called you. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of your victories. When you get it right, you take the high road, you're mature, you do the good thing. You don't slap the person in the grocery store. I, and I'm the God, not only of your uprising, I'm the God of your down setting. When you keep the car in the parking lot because they stole your space, walking away. And here I am going with you. I'm the God of your day. Yours, O oh Lord, is the day, David said. But then he said, yours also is the night. I'm the God when you get it right. But I'm the God when you get it wrong. Yeah, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, but I'm also the God of Jacob. And he's crying because he realizes if I would have known this, if I would have known I didn't have to have it all together, if I would have known I didn't have to have all my ducks in a row, if I would have known that I didn't have to be perfect, if I didn't know that after 80 years, you still haven't changed your mind, I could have got to my destination a lot sooner. I messed up. I started believing what I thought about me more than what you said about me. I started I started imagining what I would do if I was in your position. I forgot I'm not you and you're sovereign. And I didn't realize that that purpose that you put in me and that calling that you gave me, it could never be nullified and never be canceled because it came out of your mouth. And whatever you speak to has to become what you say. Because you are God. And if you're the God of Jacob, that means that if Jacob's, if Jacob's failures didn't cancel his purpose, then my failures haven't canceled mine. And Moses' life was transformed when he saw an unchanging God in a bush. I came to tell somebody who has settled in Midian. I came to tell somebody who hadn't talked to God, not really in a long time. I came to tell somebody that has messed up so bad, you are convinced you could never be used the way God said he was going to use you. And I came to tell you in spite of you, He's still an unchanging God. Last verse. First verse I read to you. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not destroyed. God is with you. God is for you. If he ever called you once, he's still calling you. If he ever blessed you once, he's still blessing you. If he ever healed you once, he will yet heal you. If he ever delivered you once, he will yet deliver you. If he ever, if he ever let you feel his presence, if, if he ever talked to you or you by yourself, if he ever visited you in your dreams, whatever he did, he will yet do. Because in spite of you, 
He is unchanging. Stand to your feet. Give him a praise all over the house. Heads bowed. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. I'm here for the person so discouraged that you thought it was over. I'm here for the person right now that's been going through so much in your circumstances that your faith has taken a hit. I'm here for the person who's disappointed in the way things have turned out. I'm here for the person that needs a burning bush experience. I'm here for the person. I don't care who else doesn't respond. I'm here for the person. I'm here for the one. I don't care if you're the only one in the room with every head bowed, every eyes closed. God has put an anointing on me to speak encouragement to you and to speak revelation of what God wants to do in your purpose. Your life is not over, and Midian is not your home. God has something specific for you to do. He saved you for a reason. He gifted you for a reason. He put you in the family you were in for a reason. He put you in the space and the circle and the city. He put you here for a purpose and for a reason. And the enemy's been in your ear telling you lie after lie, but God sent me here today to remind you. God is unchanging. You're here. You need prayer. Come to the altar right now. I want to pray for you. Come to the altar right now. I want to pray for you. You're here. You want prayer. Come. Come. I'll lay hands on anybody that needs it. Come. 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 Find you a place in the altar. Find you a place in the altar. Find you a place. Find you a space in the altar. Come from upstairs. Come from upstairs. Don't worry about people. Come. 